the talk is about the joy of living. The workshop is about the joy of living or deepening the joy of living. And in the first session, we spent time um, separating um, between the goals that we, you know, you know, traditional goals, objectives, which are measurable, smart objectives, the goals of the business world, um, uh, those sorts of goal setting processes. The, the, the business of becoming, becoming more of who you truly are, fulfilling your life calling in the world, fulfilling your potential into the world. And um, the third form of aspiration, which is being, to just enjoy life as it is, just for the sake of it. And I'm just going to stop for a second and say, Linda, you're so welcome here, and you're also welcome to cry as well. Um, you know, they say about me that... Um, Julian's only happy when his course participants cry. So um, feel free to be the person who cries today. So great to have you here, Linda. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. I think you just need some tender, loving care at the moment, Linda. Um, so great to see your face and to be in contact with you. So the three forms of aspiration in life, one is to achieve goals, you know, to make money, to achieve business objectives the second is to become more of who you truly are and the third is to enjoy life just for the sake of it just to revel in the in the in this very present moment in the beauty of existence um you know which is so magnificent but when we're running around the world we sometimes forget how magnificent how amazing how awe-inspiring existence is and and so that's where the joy of living comes from. If we, you know, if my joy of living is, you know, whether or not my partner's nice to me, whether I'm dating the right person, whether I've got enough money, whether I've got the right job, all of those things, those are ephemeral. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes they work well and sometimes they work badly. But if you can really connect with being, with the, you know, the beauty of this present moment, then that beauty is always there, whatever your circumstances. And we know that um, that's the case from um, the writings of people like um, Viktor Frankl and Bruno Bettelheim about their experiences in concentration camp. Even in the worst circumstances, if you have a really strong connection with being, then um, everything is nourishing. Life itself is nourishing. And that, so that's been the topic of the course. So in the first session, we distinguish between the different types of aspiration in life. Life is a journey. Um, life is a journey to achieve goals versus what this program is about. Life as a piece of music where we want to listen to every single note. We're not trying to get anywhere except into the present moment. Then in the second session, we focused on what are all the different methods we could use to deepen our experience in the joy of being. And then in the third session, we said, well, what happens if it's not very joyful? What if we're suffering? What if we're in pain? And we looked at the different methods for being present with pain and suffering. The, the, the unconscious method, you know, which is dissociation, which is what trauma, people who've been traumatized do, which is that people leave their bodies. They disappear from their bodies and their feelings, which may be the best solution at the time, but then you're living a life where you have no feelings, where you're disconnected from yourself and from your experience. It's, it's a short-term solution, not a long-term solution. But those traumatic situations, because we're very often not well supported in those traumatic situations, we then can, you know, the same short-term solution continues for the long term. So, um, and of course, the way to, um, to deal with those um, traumatic dissociations is... Um, to work with a bodywork specialist, such as um, somatic experiencing, and do something called titration, whereas where you just you 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 access resources and then feel just a little bit and then back away again, and then feel just a little bit and back away again, and do it in very very incremental small steps, just taking uh, a sip at a time, and then the. Um, you know, the other method, you know, the two other methods, but one of the other methods is um, to access resources and become really mindful and present and have 
the parts of you that are mindful, present, and resourceful hold the space in you, uh, hold the space for you, uh, for the parts in you that are suffering, whether it's physical suffering or emotional suffering. And so that, that you're then being tender and close with and holding that place in you that's hurting. And one thing is for sure that any pain, whether it's physical or emotional, is worse when we push it away. Um, so even though it seems paradoxical to hold it close, to hold it in a loving space, it's actually less painful than um, making a story about it. The story about the pain adds to the pain. Uh, the third method for dealing with um, suffering is, is to broaden one's awareness. So, so supposing I've got some a very, you know, something very painful in my body, but there are many other parts of my body I can be aware of as well. And in the field beyond me, you know, I can see the sky, I can hear the birds, I can hear the wind. Um, I can have a much broader perspective of life. And right now, just to sort of demonstrate that really quickly, um, that if you focus, we'll, we'll use, we'll practice peripheral vision for a moment. So that if you focus on a place on the screen, and you, you, you pick a point on the screen and look at that point. And then you soften your gaze so that in addition to that point, without moving your eyes, you can see other parts of the screen. And then you can probably see beyond that, that in the soft vision, in the soft gaze, you've got a much broader vision Actually, that soft gaze really detects movement. That's what it's mainly for. But then the ears can do the same thing. The ears can listen out to a distance. And so that's an example of broadening awareness. And just notice how your state of consciousness cha changes just through the, doing this simple process. And so in the bigger field, which is everything you hear and everything that can be seen, and all the other places in your body, all the rest of your experience can, can, is bigger and can hold the place for the, for the part of you that's suffering. So if you say, I'm in pain, um, you're saying that your identity is in pain. It's actually better in those situations to say, pain is passing through me, or uh, there is a part of me that hurts right now. So... Um, So I'm just taking a deep breath and letting myself settle. Um, notice that that itself, what we did in two minutes was a meditation that broadened our awareness. And so then today, uh, the workshop today is about how can we um, practice, it's a, it's a paradox that being is about being here now and not trying to go anywhere else, but I've been on, I've had to travel on trains to go to courses to teach me to be here now. You know, there was a course I went on called, um, let me just put the, um, uh, I'm just gonna mute everyone. People have their, are unmuted and then rustling, making noise in the background. Um, I went on a course called Nowhere to Go, but I had to get on a train to get to the course. So of course there's a paradox, isn't there? That we can do practices that take us to a place where there's nowhere to go. We can schedule time to go nowhere um, or to go somewhere. Gordon goes to the locks of Scotland with his fly fishing rod. He has to go quite a long way to then be, you know, to, to, to find a place where there's nowhere to go, you know. So that's, and I've been on Buddhist retreats where I have to, you know, I used to go and see my Buddhist master in America, I have to fly to America so that I could go nowhere. But the purpose of all of those activities is to have that sense of just presence, which is beyond past, which is beyond past and before future, in which there's just the beauty of the present moment. Um, so actually, I'd like us to just spend a little bit more time in focusing on the beauty of the present moment. So I mean, look at the screen. I think that's always a nice thing to do. And 
just look at all those interesting faces on the screen. Um, all those people, some of whom you know if you've been on previous calls, some of whom you don't know. And if you just, you can use a little bit of focused looking, you know, to look at someone's face, but also just keep the peripheral vision present. So you've got the soft seeing as well. And then you're, you know, you're hearing my voice, there may be other sounds in the house that you're in or from the street. And you're just here in this present moment with this group of people doing the same as yourself. And you can feel your body and everything that you see, everything you hear and everything you feel is arriving in consciousness, lands in consciousness. And what is consciousness? The metaphor I like most is it's like a mirror. Everything in the world gets reflected in the mirror of consciousness, but the mirror itself doesn't change. So in addition to seeing all of us on the screen, in addition to hearing all the sounds that you can hear, in addition to the feelings in your body, and I always invite people to feel their toes because it's a good long way from the brain, from the head or from the, the head brain. There are at least three different brains in the body, the head brain, the heart brain, and the gut brain. that to just notice where all the senses arrive in consciousness. And for me anyway, this sort of, this mirror is luminous. Um, anything can pass through it. Um, it's very awake and alive. And learning to notice this, um, no, learning to notice that there's only one consistent thing in your life. There's only one thing that's consistent, and that's consciousness, that this field. That is really such a gift. And then if we take this sort of mindfulness, then going into nature, I'm writing about nature at the moment, going into nature and just um, feeling the ecology of cells, of all the the different beings in the natural environment that are connecting with each other. It's a non-linear world. The nature is a non-linear world. Or going into a place that has particular significance for you, where you can sit and meditate, whether it's a church or a shrine or a meditation cushion or by a stream. And bringing this awareness, this slowing down. Um, I like to walk, and my partner and I, Sophie and I, have started practicing slow walking. It's not that we walk very slow, but we might walk only one mile an hour when other people might walk two or three miles an hour because we want to really enjoy every step if we're on a you know, six-mile journey or a 10-mile journey. We want to walk slow, to feel it all. And so hopefully all of you have some practice that gets you into this state of being. And maybe not even one, maybe hopefully several. You know, you might have a sitting meditation. You might find that cooking works. Time in nature might support you. What are the, or playing with a child, listening to music. Hopefully you have quite a number of different activities that take you into this sense of the present moment. And then once, so once you know, once you have a way into this sense of the present moment, then you, we just practice more and more. Um, you know, my friend and colleague, Steve Gilligan, would say that he wouldn't accept therapy clients who didn't have a daily meditation practice 
But recently I've heard him say that he really expects people to meditate once an hour or to, be, to, to do a mindfulness practice once an hour. And actually the body naturally regulates that way because actually, and I can't quite remember what the number is, but it's either 45 minutes or an hour and a half. I think it's an hour and a half. Um, one of the brain rhythms, uh, uh, it's not the circadian rhythm, it's the other one, but I can't think of what it is now. People naturally want to go and take breaks, which is why offices have coffee machines, or you go to the kitchen, make a cup of tea. It's a sort of mindless activity that's very, that can be very mindful. It's not focused, it's soft. A sort of mindless activity that can be mindful. A friend of mine, he's quite, he's quite a rebel, a famous psychotherapist, says, you know, we shouldn't be practicing mindfulness, we should be practicing mindlessness. And what he means by that, of course, is not just being unconscious, but relaxing that conscious focus that we have to spend so much of our time in. And being idling, you know, is a good word. There's a word for it in um, French. I can't think, I think they're called flaneurs. It's, it was a movement of people who would just wander around the streets doing nothing at all. And, you know, and there's books, and I think there's even was a magazine called The Idler in England, um, just to spend time doing nothing. You know, the, the most advanced Buddhist practice is doing nothing and not even allowed to meditate. It's actually a really hard practice because your mind is going, well, how do I do nothing? That's the whole point. You've got, we've got to get beyond that mind that's trying to do something. And certainly for me in nature or for me with a child who I'm not, res not particularly responsible for, you know, where I'm not parenting or for me with a pet, or for me, when I can walk slowly down the street and notice the flowers that are growing out of someone's garden wall. Or a moment of engagement with somebody in the street or in, um, I had to have a blood test this morning and um, I had a you know, funny conversation with the nurse taking the bloods. We had, I had time, I was relaxed, she was relaxed. They always want to stick this tape onto you to me after they've, you know, um, after they've taken the blood. And I always say, you know, well, you know, if I, I'm not here for a waxing, please don't stick elastic, you know, sticky tape on me. I'll lose all the hairs on my arm. It's not what I'm here for. So we have a bit of a laugh about that. We have a, you know, a joke about it. Um, so those little moments of the divine, of the sacred unfolding, whether it's, you know, the Japanese drinking of a cup of tea or the Chinese drinking of a cup of tea, you know, the, the, the tea ceremony. You know, if we could, there are so many activities that we could do like a tea ceremony, like as a mindfulness ceremony. But actually, we, given we have busy lives, we can start by just finding moments once an hour and finding longer periods during the day. And, you know, you know, you will have better longevity, better health, a better immune system if you spend time in nature every day. That's the evidence. You, you spend time in tw more than 20 minutes in nature every day, you will have be healthier and have a longer life. So why not have a sitting meditation practice or a moving meditation practice in the morning and then spend some time in a park in the, uh, you know, in the afternoon? Doesn't that sound like a nice day? Um, and have you ever, you know, I don't know if everybody has, but um, what about, you know, enjoying being in the rain? You know, there's no such thing, Jordan will know about that because of his time on, on the locks of Scotland. You know, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's just bad clothing. Now, of course, if it's bitterly cold and there's terrible wind, you know, you may need to learn how to deal with that. But um, in the summer, there's nothing better than walking in a light rain. And in the winter, if you're dressed properly, it can be pleasant too. All, you know, all the colors are more vivid. So how can we get out of the boxes that we're in, in, the, in, in modern city life, and spend a little bit more time returning to our animal nature, our mammalian nature? Our, uh, you know, most of our brain is pre-human, if you like. 
the neocort language is only between, I think it's 100 and 100, was it 50 and 150,000 years old. But nature has been communicating since the beginning of time. I've been reading about this. You know, all the interactions of nature is communication. Um, all the bacteria communicate with other bacteria. There's, there's a language of nature that's happening all the time. But because we've, bec we've become, we've, we've developed this incredible capacity of intellectual language and language that categorizes, we think that's communication, but that's only this recent addition. And when you go into a forest or a wood or a lake or a river, and river or by a river and you sit and relax, then you, you know, the birds communicate and you hear the animals. Um, you know, you feel the fly or the wind on your skin. You feel a part of the, you know, they call it now an ecology of selves. The nat nature is an ecology of selves. Uh, there's all this research now. I, I haven't, I'm just reading about it at the moment about the fungal networks that are in the in forests and that forests will actually um, a carbon rich tree will pass carbon through the fungal network to a, a carbon deficit tree and uh, uh, nature magazine call this the um the wood wide web um which because the world wide web was was famous in the 1990s the, the nature the science magazine called it that we're a part of the web of life so it's like really taking time to experience, to let yourself experience that. Can I check? Does everybody here have a method for connecting with that? Knows how to connect with that sense of being? Put your hand up if you, if you can. Great. So oh, I'm going to do it the other way around. If you haven't got a way of connecting with that, put your hand up. That's a brave, more difficult question. Okay. Great. So nobody has put their hand up. So you all know what I'm talking about, which is great. Any questions or comments on what I've said so far? I was going to say, uh, Julian, it was only during the lockdown that I developed that um, capacity and that priority. And also by attending this, uh, the, these courses with you where uh, that was um, in some ways more ingrained and intensified. So thank you. Right. Beautiful. I'm so happy, Paul. Nice to have you back wherever you've been. Um, I I had uh, contracted COVID on the, April the 1st, and I had a week in hospital also with the consequences. Did you? And But you, you seem, how are you now? Um, recovering. I lost all the appetite for three weeks, so I didn't eat. Uh, I was dangerously unwell, frankly. Uh, now I'm building up um, my reserves. My I've still... Um, not back to normal so that will take a few more weeks yeah exactly well done to your immune system great um any yeah any other questions or comments marina yeah um i'm just i haven't really formulated it but the you know when you're like cooking supper or something and i really get into what i'm doing versus if i'm out in nature i'm going wow look at that amazing tree or listen to those birds i can connect with that and i'm sort of still mulling over this the difference between sort of being i do really get it because i really get it when i do the meditations where you're really connected and then i go am i confusing anything else with sort of numbing out or not being present you know when you forget about yourself that one actually it's more in the flow, actually, but I'm interested in that. That's and then the other, I've got another quick question as well. The, on the, when I listened to the recording, the last one, that's really good. You talked about um, every, in an hour, I think, six times in an hour, getting present. And I'm going, is that then just stopping, going, what do I see, hear and feel? And no chatter. Is that what you meant? Yeah, like just taking, I mean, like we can do right now and take Take a deep breath, feel my breath, my body's here. You know, the body is in the present, you know, so the body's here in the present. I'm just aware of what I see and I hear, and I'm just connecting more in here, in my body here, than I am in my 
in this little part of me. Um, Got it. Yeah, and just doing that, doing that regularly. But going back to the point that you made before, there are different classes of, um, if you like, mindfulness practice. And one of them, um, you know, you know, is called flow states. And flow states are when uh, um, a lot of your attention is needed for the activity that you're engaged in. Um, and it, but it's not too much, it's not too much, it's a stretch, but not a stress. So it takes you into high performance. And so the, the um, there's a thing in from psychology, seven plus or minus two, the conscious mind can only attend to between five and nine chunks of information at any one time. And so when you're involved in an activity that requires that you process more than, than between five and nine chunks of information, the unconscious has to take over. And so then you sort of go into that zone, which is why um, sports like tennis, where you have hand-eye coordination, are so good. You, you can't play tennis well and not be present. You can't, um, you know, there are a lot of activities. You can't... Um, I was, my, my example is you can't drive a car over the speed limit without being present unless you're a dangerous person, you know. Um, you can't, um, uh, you know, probably when you're cooking, you may, all of you is required in that cooking process. Or if you're playing a musical instrument, it's going to be much better within all of you who's totally engaged in that. And so those are, or if you're re really in the zone as a coach or a teacher or a university lecturer, all of you is engaged in the moment. So you haven't got time to think about past and future. And so that's what being, that's what flow states are. Um, and so those, and, and you can construct activities that put you into the, into those, into that sort of overwhelm where um, your conscious mind can't handle it anymore. So the unconscious has to handle it. And, you know, sports are very good examples of that. But I remember John Grinder used, to, I can't even remember what it is now. I used to teach it, but it was like 30 years ago. He had something called the alphabet chart. And, um, and you had to move your hands differently and you'd say numbers. And it was all quite really hard to do. And of course, it puts you into that sort of, sort of altered flow state. So um, some of you with professional skills that you love or hobbies that you really love you'll get into that very focused flow state and that is slightly different marina to um being in um just an open state where you're watching everything you see here and feel and the, the open state is really interesting because you can observe consciousness itself but the disadvantage of the open state is that you can just get you can just go off and wander in your thinking. Now, a bit of time daydreaming when you're out in nature, or you know, it's daydreaming's a healthy activity, but we can spend too much of our lives daydreaming. That's the sort of problem. So when you're really wanting to meditate, um, you know, I read this instruction the other day from a great Buddhist teacher, which I I've been practicing and really enjoy. He said, stare at the thoughts. You know, stare at the thoughts because it's quite easy to say, oh, I'm relaxed, it's soft, it's nice. I haven't got any loud voices. I'm not planning. But underneath there's this little voice, low level voice, just chatting away, talking about this, talking about that. And so and it's quite easy to say, to think that's meditating. You know, it's a sort of beginner level thing. Um, it's always a beginner level meditation. But then after, you know, but you could waste a lot of years you know, sitting in a Buddhist refuge, thinking you're meditating when actually you're just talking to yourself at a low level. And so, you know, so the instruction is, well, stare at the thought. I mean, the really interesting question is, so can you look at the thoughts as they arise and catch them as they come out of the rabbit hole? Did you know that thoughts live in rabbit holes? They're basically rabbits. I'm sort of, joking here a bit but it's like can you where do they come from can you catch them as they come out of the rabbit hole because and the earlier you catch them the less likely they are to hang around to, you know to grab you so another teacher says i think Tiknet khan says um thoughts are okay but don't think about the thoughts 
It's like the thought rises and you just, you can see the thought, but you don't engage with it. But for me, I find it easier. The earlier I can catch the thought, the less likely I am um, to be hooked by it. Um, and then if the brain, you know, if you're bored, the brain will start to give you the really, the most delicious, sexy thoughts, you know, either you as the world leader, you know, or you as a saint or, you know, you on a hot date or, you know, the, the, the mind will create all of this stuff, but you've just got to watch it and, um, and catch it before it, it's hooked you. Um, but that's, so that's the hard thing about um, just being in the pure open state. But the benefit is, is that's the closest you'll ever come to reality is to watch how everything arises. You know, even naming the tree, even naming the grass, naming the bird is, is a construct that you've, that we've, you know, we were labeling the world rather than, you know, we're putting a label on the world rather than letting the experience come to us. Um, I mean, the ultimate meditation state is when you're so present that the, as you learn meditation, you have to watch it. You, you watch everything arising. And then when you get really good at watching arising and you're pretty still, then you you relax just a little and there's because and then the person who's watching disappears as well um when when you've not done any meditation you know you can just you could just wander off it's once you've got a reasonably stable meditation practice but in some sense we're talking about advanced stuff here and maybe the only benefit of talking about advanced stuff is that that the highest you know um, in, in vow of enlightened or people on the path to enlightenment is to continually throughout the day return to the present moment, to take refuge, that the higher power that they're taking refuge in is not some image of a God out there, but in, 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 um, the, pre in the present, in presence, which is here everywhere all of the time, and to keep returning to that. And that's all that, that you need. And for, you know, except that I need to go to the shops as well. But I suppose that if I was really present, my tummy was hungry, I would go to the shops. Maybe I would, you know, get myself some lunch, you know, but just to really commit to being in the flow. So I'm not suggesting that we can all, we all do that just right off, but to have a little bit of that in our lives and to start to explore that. Um, and just to take, it's incredibly nourishing and healing. So it's very, very healing. It's very emotionally nourishing. And so quite short amounts of time, really taking refuge in the present moment has this fantastic, you know, beneficial well effect on our well-being. And then wherever, you know, I can sit on a crowded bus and enjoy myself. I can, um, you know, I can you know, sit on an airplane that hasn't taken off. Of course, I can get frustrated. I'm not saying I'm perfect. But sometimes, you know, I'm on a plane that hasn't taken off for 45 minutes because for whatever the reason is, and I stay relaxed. What's the point in getting stressed about it? You know, there's, there's really interesting stuff in every single moment if we want to attend to it, if we can be present with it. Um, and that includes the good feelings and the bad feelings. So it's it, to say, I only want good, you know, we all say I only want good feelings, but actually there is um, joy of living, of life to even just say, well, thank God I'm feeling, I may be feeling a bad feeling, but I'm feeling, I'm alive, I'm breathing. And then there are other methods you can have to bring love to yourself. Um, I do want to mention love, actually, because um, if you do a lot of mindfulness, love just naturally arises out of the present moment. But for most of us, having resources, you know, thinking of, you know, um, you know, a great, you know, you know, Jesus or Rumi or um, the Buddha or someone who truly loves you, a female Buddha or Mother Earth, and, and feeling that love 
is a great way to open your heart so that you, you're feeling presence with an open heart, feeling that, the, you know, giving your heart a little kick step, um, kick start. So it can be really great to find a way of really connecting with um, love at the start of a meditation, because then you, it's just going to, it's going to pervade your meditation. Um, and of course, the psychological method for doing that is just to imagine people who care about you, believe in you. And many people, if you've had a difficult childhood, you can't remember anybody who loves you, cares about you and believes in you, but you probably have some friends. You probably have a teacher. You probably know something. And if, you know, you probably, your friend's dog probably is loving towards you. You know, you can, um, you know, the cat of my childhood loved me. Um, and, and one of the sort of the psychological tools that's really useful to learn is to find those people. You know, the teacher who once looked you in the eye and said yes. The friend who you haven't seen for years who really got what you were about. Um, the boss who helped you out. Um, the people in your life who, whatever you say, they say yes to you. You know, I mean, I don't mean that you they'll do anything you want. But if you say, um, you know, I remember a guy once said to a consultant, he said, I know what I'm going to do. I need to build a better relationship with my team. I'm going to, on Valentine's Day, give a flower to every woman in the office. And the person who was listening was able to say, oh, what a great idea. Because most people would have said, mm, I think that's a bit sexist. And what are, what are the guys going to think? But her first response was to say yes. So who, who are the people in our lives whose first response is yes to us, who, who get us? And then, so to build that image, you know, so uh, some of you, you've heard me talk about this before, but just to say it again, you know, see them, hear their voice talking to you, feel how that feels in your body and really build that. And then you can, you know, and you can also, I'm repeating some of the things I said yesterday, Iris, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, you can have a friend who you've fallen out with, but there was a time when you were really close. We'll pick, just make an edited highlight of the time you were really close. You can pick an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend where, you know, the way you parted may not have been totally comfortable, but there was a time when they really saw you and got you and that were there for you. And you just, edit that piece of the, videotape you know it's just you just like making a you make a cutting of the videotape put it on a loop like the edited highlights on a football game you know the whole football game may be really boring everybody's playing defensively and and then but if a couple of goals are scored in a beautiful fashion you just make the edited highlights of those couple of goals um and then just to mention, of course, the other one, spiritual beings are great. You know, spiritual archetypes are really helpful. And you could, it's your head. You know, you can break all the rules. You know, you can have whoever you want in your mind. You know, I, I like to have um, Jesus and, well, I shouldn't really say this, but I'm saying it now, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And I think of them as a couple, to be quite honest. And then I have them hanging out with Padma Sambhava, who was the Indian tantric guru who went to Tibet and formed Tibetan Buddhism with Yeshe Sogyal and the four of them like double date together and they go out and they hang out and it's all really good and you know Jesus will come and sit next to me on the sofa sometimes you know it's like I don't have to see him hanging out in the sky one time somebody was saying somebody you know I have I've had trouble with Christianity in my life so being friends with Jesus is quite helpful <laughs> you know one time I had this somebody was saying something that really annoyed me and I felt Jesus sitting next to me and he sort of, he, he put his elbow in my ribs and he said, I'm not a Christian, <laughs> you know, like that in my ear. And, and I relaxed, you know, it was sort of like, so just make it all up. It's your head. You make your own movies, you know. I'm not saying that Jesus has come to me personally and I'm going to stand on a pulpit. And I'm just saying, have, you know, make up your own fantasies. You know, Lao Tzu, have Lao Tzu to tea. You know, or Chuan Tzu. Um, you know, or, you know, Galadriel from Lord of the Rings. Who 
whoever you want. So all of those resources can just help us feel good because, and then presence practice is, is supported. That's why people teach that stuff so that the presence practice is supported. Um, you know, the Zen, the, particularly the Japanese Zen, Zen, you know, is really quite tough. You know, they sit, they take a Westerner, they sit them on the floor cross-legged for hours and they say, just pay attention to the pain in your legs. <laughs> you know, and you spend a sort of week in total agony paying attention, trying to just bring awareness practice to the pain in your legs. Where actually um, that sort of Japanese Zen, you know, Chinese Zen is more relaxed. Um, you know, actually finding it, making it enjoyable is really helpful. You know, going and smelling the flowers, not worrying too much about your thoughts. You know, picking, when was the last time you picked up earth in your hands and smelt the earth? You know, just sort of immersing yourself in it. So, so as you can see, there are different levels of practice to, you know, the flow, flow states where you're really focusing on something, meditation states where you're really watching your thoughts, more relaxed, open states where you're really present with probably some th thoughts and you're just saying, oh, what does this grass feel like under my... When was the last time you walked without shoes on the grass? You know, when was when have you when did you when did you last swim naked at night? When my mother was really old, she lived in a cottage on her own, and she had we had a carer. Fortunately, we had a rich um, friend of the family who helped us pay for a carer. Then, when my mother died, we paid him back with the money from her house, and the carer was living in the house. But my mother's cottage, there were no other cottages around the house. And um, Carrie called me and said, what do I do? Last night, it was, you know, warm summer's night. There was a full moon. Your mother took off her nightdress and walked in the garden naked. Shall we lock the door to the garden? I said, for God's sake, don't lock the door. Let her, you know, she's, she's 90, you know, let her walk naked in the garden at night. You know, if the fox, I don't think the foxes are going to mind, you know, the, the, you know, the animals in the garden are going to mind, you know. She's, that was like a spiritual, you could see that as a spiritual experience, bringing herself to the moon, you know. Do we have enough of those experiences in your life? Yeah. Any, any other questions or comments? Or should we do a meditation? One of my best experiences was at, at Sitsa, which Paul knows, I think, and was in the Aegean, in this sort of bay that's reasonably sheltered, and, and it was so flat, there was no wind. The Mediterranean could be like that, the Aegean could be like that. The water was like glass, just completely flat. And there was a really a light rain as it was getting dark. And I just swam out in this light rain across this flat ocean. And, and I felt one with life. And all the things that you're trying to achieve, that we are trying to achieve, how many of them will be remembered in a hundred years' time? You know, all the career things, you know, all of those things that we want to achieve. Who's gonna how many people, how many of them are actually gonna be remembered in a hundred years' time? You know, I had some hospital treatment a while ago and that um, my treatment was included in a research study. <laughs> and I figure that my, you know, my legacy to the planet will be that, you know, that somewhere in an archive in the British Medical Association <laughs> will be a document where I, you know, maybe that's all I'll amount to, you know, except that's not quite true because I'm someone who has loved, you know, 
I love, I can be tender. There are some people, well, after I die, there'll be some people who are grateful for my heart, my warm heart, you know. So, but, you know, all the things we run around doing, how, how really, how important are they long term in the big picture? You know, maybe just a few people when we die will, will have been grateful for our warm heart. Maybe that's enough. Maybe we could spend a little bit more time um, nourishing our warm hearts and also take risking to be innocent like a child, to talk to people in the street, you know, or to say, to ask the question of a friend that you shouldn't ask. You know, like a child would do. Why, you know, someone who kid said to me the other day, why have you got such a big tummy? Good question. Um, but to be innocent. To fall in, you know, to fall in love often. How about falling in love often? I mean, I know a woman who there's some, you know, something must have happened in her childhood. I don't know exactly what it is, but she falls in love with men really quickly before checking them out. And they're very often not quite the right person. But the basic thing of falling in love with people, I think it's great, but it's only that she gets hurt by it, the way she goes about it, that is problematic. Actually, just to, um, I once knew um, someone who did team building in an organ he'd go she'd go in and work with teams and she said first you have to fall in love with the boss then you have to fall in love with the team then the team has to fall in love with you then they fall in love with each other and then you go home okay so let's meditate um, so So I'm, I so want your hearts to feel, to feel. I quite enjoy, like it if your hearts felt my heart. Yeah. To feel your heart, to feel your love, to start with that. Feel that longing in your heart for aliveness, for moments of safe contact and intimacy. Encounter is the word psychologists use when two people just really meet, but not just with another person, with the world, you know, with a cloud. with the sun, with the rain, with a, a tree. I'm reminded of something Marina said about, you know, seeing a tree and saying, oh, isn't it beautiful? What about saying to the tree, aren't you beautiful? If you say it, you're objectifying it. It's an object. If you say you, it's a self. So. so I'm just bringing myself present. I can feel my, I'm just checking through my body. I'm inviting you to do the same. Noticing skin, your skin. There are so many ways to notice your skin. Contact with clothing, contact with the air. The way that the skin gets pressed against your body on your backside or on your feet. We could do a whole meditation just on the different sensations on your skin. I 
you could spend a whole session just paying attention to your muscles. I notice that the muscles that draw my attention first are the ones that hold my bones, hold me upright, the big muscles. I'm also aware of any places in, of, of my shoulders where there's tension, in this, where there might be discomfort. I'm just letting it be, just saying, you're welcome. And then also noticing how breathing moves a large part of the trunk of your body. Your ribcage lifts as you breathe in. Pushes the solar plexus down. And that feeling, I can, when I breathe in, it feels like I go, it goes right down to my pelvis. And then including my ears. And I've said this, you've heard many of you have heard this many times before, but I listen to the furthest sound. I listen out across London. Even if I can't hear anything, I'm So as far as I can listen, you, you are as far as you can see, you are as far as you can listen, everything you can include is you. So there's the stability of the sensations in your body. And just stare at your mind if it's busy, stare at it. Stare at the void. It's like you're with, there's a being here who's in the shadows a lot, this voice, and stare at it and listen with compassion, with a warm heart. And just keep paying attention to the different sensations in your body. What you hear outside yourself. And if your eyes are closed, what you see in your mind's eye.
And since we're here thinking about how we might deepen our joy in living, allow to come to mind those activities that give you joy in living. Allow to come to mind an activity that gives you joy in living and wonder how you can deepen your experience of that. Is there a way to go deeper into it? Or is it simply the amount of time you take in it that will help? Or is it that you want to increase the frequency of it. Don't be too analytical, just let these images, sounds and feelings come to mind. And if you see, hear and feel an experience that will help you deepen your joy of living, say yes. Make it, let it be an intention to have more, have more of this. And sometimes the best progress is to improve something 1%, just a little. If I take time in nature, if I stretch my body, if I meditate, if I engage with my partner and her children or other children, I take time to stop. All of those things add up to a great day. What are all the little things which if you did 1% more would increase the quality of your joy? Can you feel pleasure in your breathing? So then notice what's happening now, make adjustments. If you were dreaming of some activity that increases your 
joy of living. That's great. Or perhaps your mind got busy with something that's not so important. And then step back and watch that thought like a cloud. Ultimately, there's nothing wrong when you meditate. You're just observing your own patterns, the way your own humanity. And in a true Vipassana meditation, you don't change anything. You just watch it all. Let it be. But there are other meditations where you can say, let me think of someone who loves me, or let me think of a spiritual being. Let me ask in a spiritual being. Or someone who really believes in me or care, cares about me. The main thing is not to follow a, an irrelevant thought. Only today we're wondering about how we can increase our joy of living in the days, weeks, and months that come. And if you're letting yourself imagine ways in which you could stop more often, that might be great. I'm not going to go as far as asking us to live slow living. But maybe during our busy lives, we can have slow moments, slow minutes, slow 15 minutes, where we just come back to the basic pulse of the universe that is here all the time. There's a poem by Mary Oliver, The Summer's Day. And she says, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass how to kneel in the grass, how to, be, uh, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? 
Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I love that line about how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. That feeling that nothing is more important than spending a day wandering in the fields. Earlier in the poem, she says, who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing through her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. And then the poem continues with, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? I love the beauty of how important slow time was, the nourishment of stopping in nature, and of course, nature is everywhere. Your body is nature. The streets are nature, to stop in nature and feel ourselves as nature. So this has been quite a, quite a deep meditation, but with not a lot of guidance from me, really trying to have you just feel yourselves. So what I'd like to do is for us to go with this feeling into breakout groups where without engaging your conscious minds, without getting too social, being quiet, Maybe, in fact, let's do this. When for the first five minutes of the breakout group, I just want you to continue meditating in your group together without speaking. I will do the timing for that. So I'll let you know the first five minutes to be silent. But to look, you can look at each other. You can smile if, you know, gently, but not no fake smiles. You can just be aware. So include the group in your presence and just notice the field, notice the group and how that is in your awareness. And then after that, I'll let you know when. So I'll send a message to the groups after five minutes. And then we'll have three minutes for each person to talk with the full attention of everybody else in the group about what it is that you would love to do more of in terms of being really present in the joy of living. Are there activities that will support you that you'd love to do more of that 
connect you to the nourishment of the joy of living. So that will be five minutes silent meditation, looking at each other. And then after that, um, there will be three minutes per person um, talking about what it is that you might do that will help you have more of the joy of living in the days that come. So uh, we're starting uh, now. So welcome back, everybody. Um, Linda may have to leave earlier. She has another class at six, um, but it's great to have you all here. Um, any um, comments or questions um, from um, the exercise or the meditation? Just to say, I found it um, quite uplifting to, to the exercise to, you know, answer the question, what are you going to do more of to be, you know, in the, in the joy of being, and then just jot down a few simple things that you can look forward to. So um, I find that quite uplifting. Good. I think we should all plan our lives around these little events and then spread them and then... Actually, the more you spread them, then some of the other things, once you've got the well-being feeling, you could go to a meeting and just be there in presence, amazed at the human being who's in front of you. Who's, you don't tell them, but, you know, they're 7 billion years old or whatever it is. Okay. Been, you, know, that's, you know, that's one of the jokes I do in workshops. You know, you sort of look at a woman who, is, you know, and you sort of say, to her, I know how old you are. And she says, how old? And you say 7 billion years old, you know. Um, we're all seven billion years old. Um, and so, but just to look at people like that. Um, so, yeah, great. Any other questions or comments? I, I, uh, I think I luxuriated in the sense of joy in the being of another uh, whom I love dearly um, and how that has enhanced my own joy in being and actually facilitated and encouraged it in a way which is enduring, I think. But also, when we went on a bit, um, towards the end, I realised that the joy has to encompass and integrate um, the grief and lament yes. and the compassion for so much. I mean, Ukraine, for example. Yes. But there's also writ small, a friend who's fallen into an endogenous de de depression and how, how just how bad that is for her and her partner and uh, how, uh, that's almost so you know my joy has to be full of compassion yeah it's not a happy it's sort of it's, we have to be careful here that's why we had a session last time on suffering yes yes I um, you know which is it but it can be a sort of poignant joy that's lovely it can be poignant because of the the suffering of the world as well but it's a sort of you know, I love that statement, you know, we're all here to help each other get through this, whatever this is. It's like <laughs> the, what, what, what moderates the suffering is when we hold each other's hands, we look in each other's eyes and we listen to each other and we talk to each other. And there can be a joy in that. Uh, you know, I mean, I may be weird, but I used to do this chaplaincy work at this hospital mm. and I would be basically be talking to people who, whose you know, nothing good was going to happen. You know, there, no, there was no positive medical outcome. And but just listening to them lifted their spirit, lifted both of our spirits, and I'd feel joy leaving, even though I was going to talk to someone who was never going to see their child, you know, a woman who was never going to see her child again, who was going to die in that hospital a thousand miles from home, you know, or and lots of you know, very often the people in the hospital who wanted to talk were either the people who for which there was no longer hope, or people who'd had such a massive life change. You know, the worst one of the, you know, having a, you're being completely healthy, walking down the street, having a heart attack, waking up in hospital and knowing your life will never be the same again. Um, so, you know, so the poignancy of it. And I think that's one of the things that we can practice is how do we take this sense of aliveness of the poignancy of life into every situation so we can 
even in terrible situations, we can be there feeling the, you know, the longing. What's the longing for love? The longing for connection. The long. It's a beautiful thing, even if it's painful. Mm. You That's know, beautiful. It's, sort of, beautiful. it's sort of feeling that. But thank you for bringing that up. It's important. It's not. I'm not talking about a happy, happy thing. You know. Um, thanks for that. What else? Anything else? Uh, it reminded me of uh, being willing to go out and fill up rooms with uh, your energy as you remember these snippets of the great things and that how much who, whatever you're running as your inner story emanates out. I know that sounds weird. Okay. But I just, just was thinking if you're, if you're encountering nature, you have this great, big, lovely energy and you can bring that into a room with you if you go visit somebody. Absolutely. That would be an easier way to say it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and why not do it all the time? Why not do it all the time? Exactly. It makes such a difference. It makes so much more of a difference. You know, as a therapist, as a coach, as a doctor, you know, um, there's so often the atmosphere that you bring to the person is as much the healing of force as as the rest of what it is that you do. Um, I talked to someone recently who hasn't been able to sleep and she was going to see the doctor and get medication. And I talked to her for half an hour with a warm, tender heart. And the next night she slept better. She didn't need the, well, maybe she, I mean, I'm not saying she won't need the medication, but yeah. you know, it, that don't underestimate the tenderness of presence of, of the difference that that makes. Thank you, Barbara. That's beautiful. Sure. Louise. Louise. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry, struggling to unmute myself there. Um, I think what it's made me realise is the whole uh, the three of the four weeks that I've done is that actually there's a lot of joy there already. And I'm actually quite good at taking those moments, particularly in nature or gardening and stuff or going out for walks to actually stop and appreciate, to look, to smell. I mean, even just now I put my head out the door to see if I could smell that petrichor smell that you get after heavy rain. Unfortunately, I didn't. But, you know, just there's other little things that I can bring in. But actually, I'm doing pretty well. Um, there's a lot of joy there. There's a lot of those little moments that uh, I just want Beautiful. to get more of them and be a bit less task orientated, which is yeah. where I tend to all down always rushing around so just more of what i'm doing but thank you i mean that I, you know in one so you could say there are two forms of meaning in life one is to give your gift well there may be three actually but one is to give your gift to the world which is sort of the life calling thing so there's some doing a connect to that but the other one if we just take two is just being present with the divinity of this moment and just luxuriating in presence is you know that's that would that's the mystical version because people you know in, in, in you know theoc you know in th religions with gods i can't think of the right word for it you know that is god presence is the space of phenomena presence is you know uh, the kingdom of heaven is within well that means that god's home is in you you know, that's what we're paying. Consciousness, intention is of awareness, presence is the closest we can get to God. You know, that is, you know, that's where it is. That is what we're exploring. And so you can say that the knowing that is the purpose of life. Um, and, you know, of course, we can have a contrast. So there is a sort of giving one's gift to the world. There is, you know, and, you know, there is just, being for the sake of it and there's, there's also somewhere in the mix there's also love that's why I, I started with two and then said three that just love itself is you know it is not what's so beautiful about love it's, it's not only transpersonal it seems like a universal principle but also it's really you know you it really works at a human level doesn't it you know if you're kind to someone they feel great and you feel great you know, it's such a sort of universe, or to not just to someone, to an animal, or to a, you know, that wonderful that film, my my teacher, the octopus, or my octopus teacher, the moment when the have you if you haven't seen the documentary, look at it, it's on Netflix, the moment when the octopus reaches out and touches the 
the cameraman because the cameraman's come back often enough and has helped the octopus in a number of ways and the, it's the octopus who reaches out uh, to say hello. Okay, so we're almost on time. I just want to very briefly tell you that I'm not going to do weekly sessions uh, in the future. I'm going to do them about once every two weeks. Um, it felt to me that during lockdown, it was really important to have a, this sort of strong community every week. But, um, it, you know, um, but it's felt to me now that that's been less necessary. And um, I'm just changing the, the focus a little bit. So... Um, but so sometimes it's it's once a month, sometimes it's every two weeks, sometimes it'll be every week. And I thought I would just um, screen share with you. Um, uh, here are the, well, let me see if I can get the page up if I can. Um, you know, so May the 25th, what is your life calling? 8th of June, empowering your strength, really using what's great about you. 22nd of June, um, boost, um, boosting your psychological resources. So that's sort of a quick run through, you know, all that, you know, we could spend, I have previously spent six sessions on psychological resources, but here we'll, we'll um, and it's both, this session will both be for beginners and also for people who could, you know, up, who already understand their psychological resources, but could up their game. And then, um, then I, on the 20th of July, I want to talk about and run a workshop on mastery and high performance. And I'm going to include habits in that because, um, you know, you set yourself a high performance goal, but what's the habit? What's the activity that you repeatedly do that will ensure that you perform at a high performance level? So it's, you know, so that will be, that's interesting. And I'll be um, using material from sports coaching as well. And uh, there's a psychological component to it, obviously, which the sports coaches know about. And then the 7th of September will be what stops you from living your life fully. You know, the whole piece about healing emotional wounds. And I'll demonstrate this prototype model from um, Steve Gilligan's self-relations on bringing wise adult mind, warm, tender heart to yourself. And then, um, you know, aligning with yourself as an emotion, a daily practice. Um, and then something on believing in yourself. And then, really bringing the whole thing together. Everything is waiting for you on the 28th of September. You know, if you maximize what's great about you and you, you heal um, and, you know, work around and are tender and compassionate about your difficulty, then life is really waiting for you. And increasingly, I'm interested, even though that session is what is your life calling on 25th of May, um, actually, my my other title for my book, um, Life Talent Book, is um, What Does Life Want From You? How Is Life Calling You? So, and then um, after that September 1, they'll, I'll do a, a few on the spiritual, but that's as far as I've got at the moment. So um, let's just um, um, unmute and say one word um, before we finish, um, just to hear our voices before we finish. Super, and thank you very much. Gratitude to you and to everybody who's shared. Great. Yeah, very grateful. Happy. Glorious and gratitude. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to the 25th of May. Fantastic, Christina. I look forward to seeing you then. I enjoyed your session. I feel great and full of energy. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. It's lovely. Great. Lovely to have you here today. See you in a couple of weeks. Lots of love to you all. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Love to all. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.